gentlemen. If the cheaters knew what kind of karma awaits them ahead, I'm sure there would be less cheating in our lives. And so the husband found out about his wife's shocking act and began to notice red flags in her behavior. Will he reveal a secret affair and take his revenge? Let's listen to this story and find out. Recently, I came across a video where my wife was at a friend's bachelorette party where she was seen with two dancers. The video was secretly filmed by another woman at the party using her mobile phone. Later, this woman shared a video with her boyfriend, who turned out to be a mutual school acquaintance of mine. Although we weren't friends with this guy, our paths crossed in the past. The woman who shot the video instructed her boyfriend to keep it a secret, which he has been doing for many years. It's worth noting that this guy and I never got along. Our communication was limited to ordinary acquaintances, but after breaking up with the woman who shot the video, he started showing it to his friends as a funny story. The video became a constant topic of discussion at parties and gatherings of guys, which amused those who watched it very much. It is worth noting that most of the women in the video were in a relationship at that time. I couldn't get rid of the feeling that they were laughing at me and the other guys, but maybe it was just my self-doubt. No one told this story to me or my close friends until about a month ago, when one of our mutual friends had a drink with this guy. During their conversation, the story came up, and he started joking about how his ex-girlfriend captured a scene at a bachelorette party where a group of girls were having a good time and two dancers were having an affair with one of the women. She was my girlfriend then, and now she's my wife. It seems that at that time he had problems with trusting his girlfriend, so she decided to write everything down as proof of her innocence in case he accused her of cheating. As a result, she turned to her friends for help to prove her loyalty to him. Our mutual friend said that in this particular situation, all the women, including the one who was recording, went backstage to the dancer's dressing room. My girlfriend was the only one who gave her all. Not only did she engage in intimacy with an outsider, but she also practiced with both dancers at the same time in their dressing room while her friends focused on intimacy and display. She was doing it with both dancers, while the other woman was secretly recording what was happening. About a month ago, my friend found out about this situation and thought for a long time whether it was worth telling me. He hesitated because he knew about my happy marriage to her and maintained a close relationship with both of us. He understood the power of our love for each other, especially because we have two little daughters, two and four years old. Almost two weeks ago on Friday, my friend contacted me, wanting to talk about something important. From the seriousness of his tone, I decided that this was a serious problem he was facing, and he needed someone he could trust. Over the years, our friendship, which began at school, has been characterized by mutual support. The next day we agreed to meet at the bar, and I noticed that he was already there when I arrived. From his preoccupied demeanor when I appeared, it was clear that he was preoccupied with something, and I suspected that it had more to do with me than with himself. I grew up in a rough neighborhood, I'm a big guy. I've had several run-ins with the law in the past. In the past, my reputation has largely depended on my participation in the activities of the team. But now it's all in the past. I have always been considered a natural leader among my peers, and many have turned to me for advice. In my youth, I was known for my aggressiveness and frequent fights. However, multiple stays in prison, marriage, and fatherhood have changed me for the better. It's been over eight years since I last got into trouble. I became less aggressive, more balanced and matured significantly. I have two children and a full-time job as an electrician in a trade union, and I am strongly connected with one of my old friends. Our friendship began back in high school, when I always covered his back from bullies because of the age difference. Now that he is 29 years old and works for a corporation, our social circles have grown apart. When I sat down at the bar, I could tell from his body language that he wanted to say something about me, and it made me feel anxious. Meeting his gaze, I asked about his well-being and the source of his troubles. He hesitated, 
warning me that his revelations could damage my marriage, but he believed that honesty was paramount. He felt obligated to share the information to prevent any future regrets. With a heavy heart, he finally revealed his secret. A couple of weeks ago during a chance meeting with friends, one of them shared a five-year-old video. The video showed your wife in the dressing room with two dancers. The news hit me like a ton of bricks. I was overwhelmed by a mixture of emotions, anger, confusion, and shame. Part of me wanted to argue with a friend, hoping that this was all a joke. But deep down, I knew that this was a harsh reality. I clearly remember the day five years ago when my wife suggested that one of her friends attend a bachelorette party. At that time, we had already been together for about seven months, but had not yet moved in together. My girlfriend came from a traditional Irish Catholic family and was incredibly beautiful. I loved her deeply, so my first impulse was to protect her honor and reputation. In the past, I might have reacted aggressively to my friend for mentioning this, and maybe that's why he didn't tell me about it earlier. Knowing my history of anger, I asked a friend if he had a video. He said it was on his friend's phone, but he only saw part of it. I doubted his words because usually people don't watch only part of the video. But at that moment, this detail was not the most important. I realized that my friend would not bring me there just to play a cruel joke with my wife's infidelity. It would be too risky with a man like me. So I asked him how I could contact the guy with the video, and he said he could arrange everything. I asked if I could get this guy's phone number and my friend went outside to make a call. When he returned, he said that the guy was not responding, but sent a message. My friend assured me that he would keep me informed as soon as he received a reply. At first, I wanted to leave the bar and call my wife immediately, but a friend advised me to take my time and think about everything carefully before doing rash things. So, I decided to stay at the bar and talk to a friend about my relationship with my wife, which had been great up to that point. I never expected her to be involved in something like this. At the very beginning of our relationship, she showed wild tendencies, but I didn't realize how wild they could be. After that first year, it seemed to me that she had changed her views and left her parties in the past, but alcohol still manifested it on the other side. Despite the fact that she is in a serious relationship, she attended a bachelorette party where everything got out of control. Although she had alcohol problems in the past, she managed to get them under control, especially after our first daughter was born. When a friend received a message from the guy with the video, I immediately contacted him to see if we could meet and get a copy of the video on a USB stick. He said he was out of town, but would be back next week. I expressed my interest in receiving the video and asked about the compensation he could claim for deleting the video from his phone or other storage devices. I was hoping that he would agree to delete it voluntarily, but he asked for $1,500. That was one of the reasons I never liked him. I managed to negotiate a price reduction of up to $1,000. There seemed to be no reason for him to keep the video. My wife and his ex-girlfriend were no longer friends, and his ex-girlfriend probably wouldn't hurt him. I think he was just acting like a jerk. But I was glad that he asked for money, because it allowed us to draw up a legal agreement prohibiting him from publishing the video. I remain the sole owner of the only copy. I wanted not only to protect my wife, but also my daughters and myself from further shame. The idea that a recording with my wife could spread on the internet would be a serious disgrace to my family. I wanted to control the situation as much as possible so that I could deal with my wife later. From what I've heard, the video is too explicit to even think about. I was too drunk to drive that night. I had to take the elevator home and park my car in the parking lot of the bar. When I got home I could barely squeeze through the door. All I remember is that I called my wife a slut, and then I blacked out. I wanted to argue with her that night but I was too drunk to handle it. The next morning I woke up hung over on the couch, wrapped in a blanket. My wife was supposed to go to work that day but she called because she was concerned about my strange behavior and wanted to sort out the situation. She gave me a glass of water and asked me what was bothering me. When I looked at her, the memories of the previous night came flooding back to me. I was overcome with anger at my wife, which I hadn't felt for a long time. The images of her with those dancers were all I could think about. 
I couldn't even find the words to speak, I just started crying uncontrollably. I tried to remember the last time tears fell from my eyes, a moment that marked one of the darkest times in my life. My wife looked confused and started crying too, wanting to comfort me with hugs, but I pushed her away. Disappointed, she asked me over and over again what was the matter. Finally, I admitted that there was a video circulating on the internet, showing her with two dancers at a bachelorette party five years ago. Initially confused, she quickly denied the accusation, insisting that it was a fake. Despite her protests, I reminded her of a particular party and asked if she was at it. She admitted that she was there but strongly denied all accusations of infidelity. She claimed that the video was fabricated, but I assumed that maybe she was too drunk to remember what happened. She claimed that she did not remember being with two men and asked to see the video as proof. I explained that the person with the video is currently out of town. Despite my desire to believe her, she seemed genuinely convinced that she wasn't in the video. At first I suspected that this might be a scam, the purpose of which was to get a thousand dollars from me, but the amount seemed too small for such a scheme. I desperately wanted to see the video to make sure my wife was honest. The person who texted me said he would be back on Tuesday but today is only Sunday, and I felt restless. The thoughts of the video consumed me, and the strange behavior of my wife at home, who constantly checked on my well-being, only increased my anxiety. It seemed like she was trying to make me look paranoid or fabricate the whole situation. Who would fabricate such a story? By Monday, my impatience had taken over. I offered to send money through the Cash App and upload the video via Dropbox, but the person stated that he did not have a place on Dropbox to post the video. I suggested creating a new account, which they eventually did. By Monday evening, I had transferred $1,000 to his Cash App, and in response, he sent me a link to the video. When I switched to the video, I was shocked to see a group of women, including my wife's old friends, applauding the dancers. To my horror, I saw my wife indecently touching the dancers through their clothes. Then the video moved to the dressing room, where my wife and two other women were kneeling and helping the dancers. There were about five men present if you get my point. In another part of the video, my wife performed explicit actions while remaining fully clothed. Two dancers took turns making love to her. The video was poorly shot, but there was no mistaking that it was her. Her voice was unmistakable. This intimate moment, which I thought was just between us, was shared with strangers. The dancers seemed to know they were being recorded, but they didn't mind. I couldn't tell if my wife and her friends knew about the camera because they weren't paying attention to it. She was not forced to do anything. In some cases, she herself sought attention and took the initiative. She was willing to hang out with a group of guys she had just met that evening, but when I first met her, she seemed more reserved to me. When we started dating, I didn't see her as a pure angel because she was known as a party girl. She made me wait about two months before we had an intimate relationship, so I never suspected anything else about her. Now everything I thought about my wife is being questioned. In our current relationship, her closeness to me is very important, especially after the birth of our second daughter. And yet she freely participates in intimate acts with strangers, without experiencing any hesitation. I just need to express my disappointment, because I always believed that there are special moments that can be shared with a loved one. But now it seems to me that this faith has been shattered. My self-esteem has been seriously damaged, and the thought that in the past I was not good enough for her does not leave me. It seems to me that I no longer satisfy her needs. I've gained weight lately, but I used to be in great shape. I consider myself attractive, but despite this, she voluntarily chose to be with someone else. I wonder if anyone else has been through this, because I can't be the only one. My wife was almost perfect until I saw this video. She is a great mother to our children and takes care of me. She's not lazy like the other unfaithful wives I've heard about. She's very traditional now, although she wasn't like that when we first started dating. Because of this, it's hard to just drop everything. 
They were protecting themselves. Although it doesn't matter. She was so caught up in it, that she probably wouldn't have noticed if they hadn't been using protection. I remember perfectly well how she insisted on using protective equipment during our first intimacy. At that time, it really earned her a lot of points in my eyes. But now, in light of recent events, I can't help but doubt the authenticity of our relationship. Maybe I do not know who she really is? Could she have had other partners that I didn't know about, given how convincingly she denied that I had stumbled upon her in the video? If I hadn't seen the video myself, I might have believed her carefully thought-out denials. But now I doubt everything. When she returned home that evening, I turned on the incriminating video on the TV, hoping to see at least some signs of remorse or apology. But instead, she seemed to have rehearsed excuses ready. She even stated that at that time, we did not have an exclusive relationship, and that we were not in a relationship at all. I was stunned, and couldn't resist retaliating. Although she may have correctly said that we did not have an exclusive relationship at that time, we both know that she is untrue. It's not normal to have such intimacy with two men. The person she introduced herself to me, and has continued to behave since our first meeting is not like the one I see on the video. She then changes her story again, blaming her actions on being drunk and claiming that alcohol made them take advantage of her. I pointed out that she was clearly a willing participant, and there is not a single moment in the video when she resisted. In response, she stated that the video was changed and inaccurately reflects the situation. She also explained her behavior by drinking alcohol. Although she may have been slightly intoxicated, she maintained coherence of speech, demonstrated normal motor skills, and did not pronounce words indistinctly. Despite this, she continued to come up with excuses and avoid full responsibility. I decided not to get into an argument with her, but it seemed to me that she was shirking responsibility. When I told her about this incident, she got upset and said that it shouldn't bother her, because at that time we were only friends with privileges and were not in a serious relationship. She argued that her past shouldn't be against her, and asked me to think about how I would feel if she judged me based on my past. She insisted that she accepts me for who I am, and asked why I couldn't do the same for her. Even though I've never had an aggressive relationship, her refusal to take responsibility for her actions almost pushed me over the edge. I didn't want to disturb my children's sleep, and couldn't stand her presence that night. Therefore, I decided to leave home, taking a few things with me, and find shelter with a colleague to calm down and prevent any actions that I might regret. Considering that I was already on probation, I decided to change something. I packed up my regular and work clothes and went to stay with a lonely friend, who also turned out to be my work colleague. Despite my wife's insistent calls to return home, I decided to ignore them. I knew that eventually, I would have to face this situation, but at that moment, I was too upset to be in her presence. She sent me messages accusing me of not being ready to forgive her for past mistakes, drawing parallels with how she forgave me for spending almost a year in prison for aggravated assault and ten years on probation, which prevented me from moving forward in life. Although my wife went to college and works as a physical therapist, I did not pursue higher education. But I can earn more by working as an electrician in the union during the day and doing additional lucrative projects in the evenings and after work. It began to seem to me that our marriage was turning into a farce. I did not know who my wife really was. I didn't expect her to be perfect when I proposed, knowing that everyone has their own secrets. But her unsolved story seemed exorbitant to me. I always thought she was a typical party girl, I remember asking her about a past relationship, and she stated that she had only had five boyfriends which I realized was a lie, considering what happened at the bachelorette party. I knew about three of her ex-boyfriends and two brief affairs, so who knows how many more there were. Despite all this, I still believed that we had a strong relationship. But doubts crept in when I wondered what other lies she was telling me. I was left at a loss and didn't know what to believe. Everything in my life seemed to be collapsing around me. 
I couldn't spend much time with a friend because important electrical projects and deadlines were waiting for me at home. My house was not only a place of residence, but also served as a warehouse and office for all my equipment, so I could not avoid returning for long. Despite feeling depressed, I had to return home two days later to fulfill my duties as a father and meet the deadline for the contract. The thought of divorce or legal separation did not even cross my mind at that moment. I was still trying to make sense of everything that was happening and felt deeply depressed. I suddenly lost the feeling of hunger and felt a deep desire to trust someone. My father has always been a reliable source of support in difficult times, although in my youth I ignored his instructions, which led me into trouble. As I grew up, I learned to appreciate his advice more. I decided to go to my father and tell him about my current predicament. He was stunned, because he also did not expect the true character of my wife, although he knew about her past difficulties, similar to my own. My parents loved my wife very much, believing that she awakens the best qualities in me and has a positive impact on my life. She had a talent for presenting herself to them from a certain angle, which they found very favorable. Whereas most people who knew her might not see her like this unless they were close friends. My father, who has been married to my mother for 36 years, expressed several thoughts about the relationship. He mentioned that things were different in their time, especially due to the lack of social media for women. This expanded their circle of communication with men and ways to seek confirmation outside of their immediate environment. In today's world, women can attract the attention of men around the world through social media. I realized this phenomenon when I discovered my wife's online accounts, but I'll talk about this later. My father urged me to return home and ensure a stable presence in the family, especially for the well-being of my children. After our conversation, he advised me to approach my wife with an open mind and without judgment in order to reduce her defensive reaction and, in the future, work on reconciliation if she is willing to make an effort. He said that the grass is not always greener on the other side, and if my wife is capable of deceiving me, then there is no guarantee that another woman will not do the same. Although he acknowledged that it would be difficult to get over what had happened, he suggested that if forgiveness proved too difficult, I should start considering other options. After our conversation, I felt more determined to return home. I decided to deal with the difficult situation directly. After coming home and taking my daughters to kindergarten, my wife asked for a private conversation. I suggested we talk later in the evening, noticing that tears welled up in her eyes. Although I did not feel much sympathy for her since she did not admit her guilt, I received a message from a friend saying that he had deleted the video and no longer owned it. Unable to confirm this, I could only take his word for it. I also told him that I would send him some legal documents as we agreed. When I got home that evening, my wife was already there. I expected her to finally admit that she cheated on me and admit that she was dishonest and deceptive at the beginning of our relationship. When I approached, she was sitting on the balcony, but when I looked at her she seemed completely different to me. The idea that I had about her collapsed. I used to consider myself the only person burdened with a difficult past, but now I realize that everyone knows about my difficulties. Despite this, I am ready to take responsibility for my mistakes. When I got home, I found her on the balcony, where we often talked. The weather in Massachusetts was usually pleasant in the summer, and it was an ideal place to relax. She greeted me, but I didn't say anything, going into the house to take a shower and change my clothes. A moment later, I returned to the balcony with a beer in my hands and joined her in peaceful silence. I decided to give her my word and wait to see what other tall tales she would come up with. I felt that she was expecting a barrage of questions from me, but I preferred to leave the tension in the air. She began by admitting her infidelity, attributing it to a past stage of her life. She admitted that at the beginning of our relationship she doubted their longevity and was still at the stage of wild, deplorable parties. She sincerely expressed regret for her behavior. She claimed to have been faithful to me ever since, but I couldn't understand how she could have had intimate relationships with other men the same evening she met them. 
I have been patiently waiting for months for her to begin intimacy with me. Despite her repeated statements that she is not ready. She justified her actions by saying that she wanted our first time together to be special and meaningful. Unlike her meetings with dancers, which, according to her, meant nothing to her. This explanation didn't make sense to me. I told her that she knelt with them on the first day, so why should I wait for a special event? It seemed that she was refusing intimacy as a reward for me, while openly communicating with strangers in a provocative manner in front of her friends. I asked if she had any other meetings that were not captured on video. She claimed there weren't any, but I expressed my skepticism. She suggested that I check her phone and social media, thereby confirming that she was telling the truth. I assumed that since she had enough time to edit her story, she should have had enough time to delete all incriminating evidence from her phone. Although I didn't expect to find anything, I agreed to investigate. She gave me all her passwords. Despite the fact that she partially admitted her guilt during our conversation, I suspected that she was still hiding information. This doubt crept into my soul, causing me to completely lose confidence in her. I decided to follow my father's instructions and try to restore my relationship with my wife. That evening it seemed too difficult to share a bedroom with her, so I suggested that she sleep in the guest room. The next day, Despite my initial reluctance, I couldn't resist the temptation to check my wife's social media accounts. I assumed that she had deleted all the evidence, but annoying thoughts kept coming out of my head, making it difficult to concentrate on my work. I gave in and decided to log into her social media to read her messages. I found myself constantly checking her social media and soon realized that it was a toxic habit. Although she didn't write anything inappropriate, I was amazed at the number of guys who corresponded with her. I noticed that she was deleting these messages, probably to hide them from me since I had notifications set up. Whenever I tried to view a message, it mysteriously disappeared before I could read it. I wondered if this was not a common occurrence for attractive women. Even those who did not post thought-provoking materials corresponded with her. Most of the men were from the Middle East and South Asia which somewhat dispelled her fears. A week later, our relationship remained strained, but at least we talked. We haven't been this close since I found out about the cheating. But my wife made efforts to restore our connection and was disappointed by my unwillingness to move forward. During the conversation, she suggested contacting a marriage counselor because she could no longer tolerate my behavior. I told her that I couldn't just dismiss what had happened by talking to someone. This affair was straining our marriage, and the constant checking of her social media and messages was exhausting me. Despite the deterioration in my health, I decided to stop, because it seemed to me that I could not trust her. I started to worry that people were gossiping about me behind my back. One day I was at a bar with friends, and saw that some acquaintances were chatting with the person who sold me the video. I had a clear feeling that people were looking at me, but quickly averted their eyes when I caught them doing it. Their behavior looked like a mockery of me. At first I doubted if it was paranoia, but after watching the video, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that everyone was secretly laughing at me. I felt disappointed, depressed, and even angry at times. I felt disrespected which forced me, as an old version of myself, to confront them and express my dissatisfaction. It was annoying to watch grown men behave like immature children, but I suppose some people never really grow up. Instead of meeting them face to face, I decided to leave the bar and return home earlier than planned. It's been two weeks since the day I found out everything, and during that time I haven't been physically close to my wife. I was trying to get marriage counseling, trying to move forward and mend my relationship with my wife. Her act was constantly present in my thoughts. My wife scheduled counseling sessions, and we arranged for a babysitter to look after the children while we went to them. Before the first session, I was afraid that the therapist might put all the blame on me. I read about him on this site, but it turned out not to be what I expected. The therapist talked to my wife in a respectful but direct manner. I won't go into all the details, 
but it seemed to me that it was a complex process aimed at encouraging my wife to be completely truthful and regain my trust. New revelations surfaced, and my wife's answers made me wonder if there had been more similar cases, although perhaps we will never know the whole truth. I doubted my wife's honesty, and it seemed that the therapist shared my skepticism. The therapist encouraged us to focus on reconciliation and gave us the tools to restore trust. But I was skeptical about this idea, since my wife seemed to be hiding information from me. By the third session, it seemed to me that my wife had pulled away from me, feeling like a defender and a victim of attacks. I discovered new aspects about her that surprised me and made her uncomfortable. She even offered to find another therapist. But I decided not to go. She started making excuses like coming in late and referring to a busy work schedule, trying to stop us from going. Sometimes she canceled plans in advance without informing me. All these actions made me believe that she really wasn't responsible for her behavior. This happened about six weeks after I found out about the betrayal. I eventually talked to a friend who informed me about the video featuring my wife. I asked if he knew how many people had been informed about this. He said that he was one of the last in his circle of friends who was aware. Many people from school days and most of his friends were already aware. He mentioned that he found out about it by accident. I also told the guys who were teasing me the other day about this incident, and it turned out that they were aware of it too. It seems that most of the guys in our city were privy to the video, and I was the last to find out about it. It was a pretty awkward situation for me. When I got home, I told my wife about my concern about the widespread distribution of the video, and that it could still be spreading. She suggested the idea of moving to another area, and even changing jobs. It became obvious that she was thinking about moving long before I mentioned the video. I had a suspicion that she might have known about the rumors surrounding the video before I found out about it, hinting that she might have found out about it before me. I decided to contact some of the friends who featured in the video, thinking it would be a good idea. Some of them are no longer friends with my wife, and others are still friends, but they may not be completely honest with me to protect her. Some who weren't her friends moved away. I've tried to contact them via Facebook messages, but so far, none of them have responded. Three months have passed since the discovery of this truth, and I discovered that I had entered into an intimate relationship with my wife. She deliberately tried to seduce me around the house, and one night I finally gave up. This time it wasn't so much about love as about desire and disappointment. After I discovered this video, she decided to stay in the master bedroom for the first time. The next evening she tried to resume intimacy but I didn't feel it. I rarely refuse intimacy with my wife, so she was upset. She was ready to try in the bedroom what I always wanted but I just couldn't do it. She tried to hug me but it was too much, I put up with it one more night. I reached the limit and decided to sleep on the couch because I couldn't stand lying next to her. The next day, she expressed her chagrin at my suffering and suggested the idea of giving me an annual pass to the gym. I declined the offer, explaining that my problem was not physical intimacy with others, but rather a lack of emotional connection with her. Despite her offer, I knew that she was no longer the person I once thought she was. After about four months of such emotional distance, I realized that I needed something deeper and more meaningful in a relationship, which I thought I could no longer achieve with her. I called my father and told him about my difficulties with forgiving my wife, as well as that I was thinking about a legal divorce. He suggested the idea of temporarily moving to another place for a few months, believing that separation could bring clarity. When I returned home, I informed my wife of my decision to find a new apartment nearby so that I could see our children often. Despite her pleas, my decision was final. A week later, I finalized the lease of a furnished studio apartment located near my house for a month. Throughout this time, I have been struggling with the uncertainty surrounding the divorce decision. The thought of living away from my children and leaving my wife weighed heavily on me. Despite all my efforts to stay in the marital home, I eventually came to the conclusion that a temporary separation from my wife 
was necessary for my mental well-being. It was not my intention to move out completely, rather, I wanted to devote some time to myself. In addition, I kept the keys to the house where my work tools and equipment were stored. On the evening before my move into the apartment, there was a heated argument between my wife and me. She was very upset, insisting that she was giving me freedom during the whole process. She thought my actions were completely irrational. She accused me of going crazy by leaving them because of an incident that happened when she wasn't even sure we were in a relationship. I reminded her that we had already talked about this, and expressed confidence that she was still hiding something from me. I explained that I needed time to collect my thoughts. She asked how long we were going to live apart, and I suggested that we separate for two months, since most of my things were still in the house. We agreed to work on restoring our relationship. Moving into a studio apartment brought me a sense of calm. The first day was difficult, as my wife was extremely upset with me. She went so far as to tell our four-year-old daughter that I had abandoned them, which was very insulting for a small child. When I took the children to kindergarten, my daughter burst into tears. When I asked what was the matter, she replied that mom had said that I had abandoned them. I assured my daughter that I had not abandoned them, as I still take them to the garden every day. After taking my daughters to school, I called my wife to talk about how she manipulates our children by spreading lies about me. I urged her not to involve them in our differences. She categorically denied any wrongdoing claiming that she was not lying for me because she believed that I had abandoned them. I reminded her that even though they no longer live together, I continue to fulfill all my duties as a father. The next day I took the children to kindergarten, and they both looked happy when I left for work. After finishing my work in the office, I immediately went to my client's construction site to complete several additional projects. After returning home I rested, sticking to the same daily routine. I tried to limit my communication with people so as not to run into those who saw the shameful video with my wife and not to be subjected to another ridicule. My wife and I discussed the possibility of moving as soon as we reconciled, but for now I was busy with work and kept mostly to myself. I haven't had a chance to see my wife all week, but we've been in touch by phone. Our conversations mostly focused on organizing our children's schedules, and sometimes she kindly brought me food. It was a quiet week, without disagreements, breakdowns, and constant requests from children. It was like a mini vacation. I even thought about going back to our house when everything calms down. I decided that I needed to be alone to collect my thoughts away from my wife and children. I have friends who go on a week-long hunting trip to places like Montana and Arkansas every season. They invited me to join them on an upcoming trip next month. In the past, I hesitated because my wife always found reasons why I shouldn't go, and I usually agreed. But this time, my friend was able to get a group discount for us, which made the trip more affordable. Despite the fact that the hunt is still a month away, I have already bought a ticket. We're going to be traveling in my buddy's van, and it's going to be a great time. This is something that is eagerly awaited in our difficult times. Over the next few weeks, my daily routine remained the same, until one day my wife called me in a panic because the dishwasher had stopped working. She asked me to come and fix it as soon as possible. When I entered the house to assess the situation, I was struck by the sight that opened up in front of me. The living room has been completely transformed since the last time I was there, usually just to pick up the kids or get tools from the basement. While I was repairing the dishwasher, I couldn't help but notice the changes my wife had made to the living room. New curtains and a new sofa now decorated the space. Perplexed, I asked her what the sudden change was, and she explained that she wanted a change. After successfully fixing the appliances, I went upstairs to pick up some things from the bedroom and noticed a lot of new outfits that my wife had purchased. When we discussed this, she said that she started going to the gym to focus on self-improvement and get herself in better shape. I couldn't help but feel jealous watching her put in so much effort to improve herself. Is all this redoing really her way of getting away from our relationship? 
despite the fact that I knew that leaving home was the right decision for my own well-being. Doubts did not leave me. A couple of weeks later, my wife informed me that with the onset of cold weather, there was a problem with the oven. I went to fix it and noticed even more changes in the house. I haven't seen my wife up close for a long time since I repaired the dishwasher. When I saw her waiting outside the house with our daughters, she was wearing baggy pajamas, and I didn't notice that she had lost some weight. I mentioned it, and she explained that she was focusing on self-improvement. As we talked, I got the feeling that she didn't want me to move in with her so much anymore. Why would that be? To her, I was still just a jack of all trades, taking care of the kids and making my financial contribution. I was still paying off my share of the mortgage, and she was getting all the benefits of having a man around without having to cook or have an intimate relationship with me. She seemed to be enjoying the benefits of two different lifestyles. When I told my wife about the upcoming hunting trip to Montana, I expected her to express concerns or objections, for example, that it was risky or expensive. But she remained silent, asking no questions and showing no resistance. The discussion with her turned out to be unexpectedly simple, which made me feel uneasy. I began to wonder if she had moved on and didn't care if I came back or not. That's exactly the impression I got from her. When I arrived home a week later and opened the car door for my daughters, they greeted me with delight. To my surprise, the eldest daughter asked if they would have a new dad, which took me by surprise. I assured her that I was not going anywhere and asked her the reason for her question. She mentioned that she had seen a man in the house while I was away, and I thought she might have confused him with my brother-in-law, who used to live with us but my daughter knew my brother-in-law well enough not to confuse him with someone else. I even asked her again, suggesting that she might be referring to Uncle Jimmy. But she was adamant. The man's name was Jacob, a name I had never heard before. Unable to access my wife's social media and messages due to her changing passwords after I moved in, I spent the whole day thinking about Jacob, trying to remember if my wife had mentioned him. Before I went hunting, I noticed that my wife didn't seem to be so keen on reconciliation anymore. She just wanted me to come back and fix it. This made me fear the worst that a man named Jacob was indeed romantically involved with my wife. I figured that if I acted insecure about Jacob, my wife would deny knowing about him, as she had done in the past when she tried to deny any wrongdoing and bullied me. Therefore, in the evening, while the children were sleeping, I decided to visit her. I was hoping to catch her off guard by arriving unannounced, but she didn't look shocked, perhaps because of my recent travels. We communicated politely, but I felt that the possibility of reconciliation was slipping away. Despite this, we both did not lose hope of restoring our relationship. I entered the house with the keys in my hands. She noticed me and offered me food, but I refused, wanting to talk. We were sitting in the living room, and I immediately told her what I had learned about Jacob and asked her why she was having an affair when we agreed to focus on reconciliation. I studied her body language carefully to see how she would react. She nervously ran her fingers through her hair, a clear sign that she was aware that she had been caught. Suddenly she looked up and confessed that Jacob was just a work colleague. They had a strong working relationship, and since I wasn't there she turned to him for help with the housework. I continued to press her for details. I asked if sharing our bedroom was included in this help. There was a puzzled expression in her reply, which made me insist on a clear answer. Reluctantly, she admitted that she had slept with someone else twice, insisting that it was nothing more. But I wasn't convinced by what she said about the two meetings. I knew there was more to the story. I pressed her and asked how long the relationship lasted. She tried to shift the blame on me for abandoning her and the children, but I realized that she was evading the answer. I raised my voice again, demanding an answer from her. Then she admitted that she had been in an emotional relationship with another person for more than a year, and that their relationship had moved to a physical level. After thinking about it, I remembered my suspicions during the marriage counseling, when she wanted to interrupt the session. The therapist sensed her dishonesty, and urged her to be honest. 
Looking back, I realized that I may have been deceived from the very beginning. Our relationship was based on a fragile foundation because I never really knew who she was. I couldn't help but wonder about the length of their romance. Having read a lot about infidelity, I realized that a woman who entered into numerous relationships at a bachelorette party would not be satisfied with an ordinary relationship like ours. It was hard to believe her when she said that the physical connection only took place when I was not at home. I felt in my gut that there was something more to this story. When I asked her about the possibility of reconciliation, given how long she had been involved with this man, she offered no explanation. It was obvious that she had more than just two cases that she confessed to. When I asked her if she loved him, she hesitated for a moment before answering. I got up, tired of her games. I noted that a woman who was intimate with two dancers and behaved inappropriately in the presence of her friends could not do it only twice. I told her I was glad she was happy with him, but her actions gave me good reason to seek a legal divorce. I acknowledged that the time spent together with our two beautiful daughters was meaningful, but I suggested that it was time to end our relationship. At first, I doubted my decision to leave, but now I'm sure it was the right decision, allowing her to learn from her mistakes. If I had continued to ignore her deception and manipulation, I might have remained in the dark. I am grateful to the marriage therapist for helping me see the truth although she did not directly point out my wife's dishonesty. I had enough intuition to decipher the deeper meaning of her questions and understand her point of view. It seemed that one lying person could easily recognize another. I was just an observer in their presence. Then it dawned on me that my wife knew how to hide her actions. Despite her declarations of love, when I was preparing to leave, I could not get rid of the suspicion that she was hiding something from me. Ignoring her words, I left. That day, I returned home dejected, knowing that I would not have as much time with the children as I wanted. Despite the finality of the situation, I was relieved to realize that my suspicions of her infidelity had been confirmed. It was amazing how accurately the saying about cheaters came true. Although I'm not particularly religious, I found solace in believing that the universe is somehow lining up in my favor. The events of that day seemed to unfold in a way that revealed the deception I was unknowingly living with. And that night I slept soundly, comforted by the fact that the truth had finally come out. If my friend hadn't mentioned this video, I wouldn't have had the impressions that have happened over the past few months and revealed to me the truth about the woman I've been living with for five years. The next day I called my father to tell him everything I had learned, and he comforted me by saying that I had handled the situation well. He reminded me not to blame myself, because I am not to blame for anything, and assured me that everything happens for a reason, even if it means that hidden truths become apparent. My main task is to ensure the safety of my daughters, I am very concerned about the man my wife has brought into their lives, and I need to know more about him. I've heard stories about people who get into relationships with single mothers with daughters for nefarious reasons, and I can't bear the thought of anything happening to my children. The next day, as usual, I went to pick up the children from kindergarten. My wife called me to talk about our situation and said she still wanted to deal with me, promising to end her relationship with another man. I reminded her that she had been involved with him for many years. The main issue was no longer in the spotlight. She challenged my belief that their relationship had lasted for years, insisting that they had only moved into a physical relationship recently when I left her and the children. I regarded this as a clear attempt to shift the blame, and I was not convinced. I reminded her that while we were trying to reconcile, she decided to enter into a physical relationship and even brought a man to our house. Instead of taking revenge, I felt it was time to move forward with the divorce and prioritize in favor of our daughters, since she had long since left our relationship. When I said this, she accused me of giving up first, leaving home. I stopped talking to avoid an argument. Despite her attractiveness, I knew that it would not be difficult for her to find someone new, perhaps even better than me. 
I was hoping that she would find someone who would be better suited for our daughters. The last thing I wanted was for her to bring random men into our house, putting our daughters at risk. The next day I contacted my wife's colleague, who had been her colleague at the hospital and at her previous job for two years. I called her unexpectedly and told her about my recent work injury, mentioning that I needed a male physiotherapist. I asked about a man named Jacob, as my wife suggested him, and asked if she had any information about him. I formulated the question this way, knowing that she is familiar with this place of work. She replied that she didn't know anyone named Jacob. The very next day, I called one of her employees, who had worked with my wife for two years at the hospital, as well as at her previous place of work. I unexpectedly called her and explained that I had recently suffered an occupational injury and needed a male physiotherapist. I mentioned that my wife had recommended a certain Jacob to me and asked if she knew anything about him. I asked this question because I knew she was good at her job. She replied that she didn't know any Jacob. The only Jacob she knew about was one of my wife's former clients from their previous job. I thanked her and hung up, realizing that my question had misled her. I was worried that she might eventually ask my wife about it. I decided to talk to my wife about her lies about Jacob being her colleague. I couldn't wait to discuss this face to face. Also I was worried that her colleague might call and tell her about the strange call she received from me, her husband. As a result. I quickly took action and contacted my wife to discuss the situation. I asked why she had lied to me about her partner in the affair, Jacob, with whom she had worked as a client for more than two years. I made it clear that I have the right to know who she brought to our daughters and why she decided to hide this information from me. In response, she defended Jacob, explaining that he was a widowed businessman with several hotels nearby and posed no threat to our family. She claimed that he was an honest and reliable man whom she had known for a long time, and he turned to her for services after the tragic death of his wife. She admitted that there was a strong bond between them, but refrained from further action because of her marital status. Surprisingly, after I left their presence, she decided to start a romantic relationship with him. Curiously, she tried to shift the blame onto me while admitting she was wrong. After talking to my wife's colleague, I had a strong suspicion that my wife had been in a physical relationship with one of her former wealthy clients for more than two years. I decided to check his background, and fortunately, there were no records of criminal activity. I couldn't help but feel a pang of envy, knowing that he was more successful than me. Despite this, I understood the need to find out the truth about my wife's secret adventures after the bachelorette party. It was extremely important for me to move forward and start all over again. Someone may say that a DNA test should be done for my daughters, but I believe that this is not necessary, since they bear a great resemblance to me. In short, two months later we ended our marriage and sold the house, dividing the profits. My ex-wife moved in with her lover, who owns several properties, and I moved to another city to start life with a clean slate. I found a better paying job and rented an apartment that had enough space for me and my daughters. Yes, I did everything to protect my girls from someone else's man. My ex-wife was in despair when the court made me the main guardian and was happy about it. Besides, the girls did not want to live in the same house with a strange man. A year later, I married a beautiful woman who adores not only me and my daughters, replacing their mother. As for my ex, after a terrible motorcycle accident, she lost her leg and ended up in a wheelchair. After this disaster, not even a month had passed since her rich boyfriend left her without marrying her. Her lavish life disappeared, leaving only memories of her and expensive gifts, which she soon sold in order to survive living with her parents. Sometimes she calls me and cries fervently, longing for the life that we had, but the past cannot be returned. She chased after the poor and remained in poverty and in a wheelchair, unnecessary to anyone. I found a positive moment in the fact that I had to attend a party at my wife's office, the opportunity to go out in my challenger to nature. But the downside was that the faster I pressed the pedal, 
the faster I got to the company cottage. There was a flat, 20-mile stretch of road ahead, devoid of any obstacles like stop signs or traffic lights, and my Dodge was free to demonstrate its power. But due to the lack of gas stations and shops, I had to make sure that there was enough fuel for the entire trip. Since our daughters got married, Donna and I have been growing apart. I had hoped that this new chapter in our lives would bring us closer together, but it seems that everything turned out the other way around. Despite my reluctance, Donna insisted that I accompany her to an event that she had previously attended alone. She was a drinker and a socialite, while I preferred to keep a low profile and only occasionally took a sip of beer. Over the past year, I had begun to suspect that she was having an affair, but at the moment the situation seemed indifferent to me. I think that was one of the reasons we were moving away from each other. I was patiently waiting for the opportunity to leave a relationship that had become unpleasant to me. I was looking for a way to end my marriage. I must admit that I may have been the catalyst for my wife's decision to leave. I have always been a minimalist, which is explained by my upbringing in a family that was experiencing financial difficulties. My brothers and I had much less than our peers. No bicycles, no toys, no pets, no fancy gadgets. It seemed to me that I lead a lifestyle similar to the Amish, but without religious beliefs. I was not naive and understood how society works but I could not bring myself to fully accept it. I understood how important it was not to get into debt, pay bills on time and save money for the future. Living in a minimalist style did not require fanaticism, but rather self-discipline. By allowing myself a little luxury, I was able to fit into society while maintaining my principles. Most of all, I loved my marriage and family. It wasn't easy to find a partner who could tolerate my quirks and accept my uniqueness, but I found him in Donna. She came from a similar background and understood the value of a frugal lifestyle, although she did not fully accept it, as I did. As our marriage progressed, I noticed that Donna was becoming more accustomed to a more average lifestyle, which I found difficult to accept. But with the arrival of our daughters, I began to understand how her priorities and actions had changed. In order to better fit into society, we decided to purchase a modest house and update our wardrobe. Donna began to pay more attention to her appearance, regularly doing hairstyles and improving her self-care and makeup skills. We also purchased two smartphones of a more expensive model. When our daughters grew up, Donna got a minimum paid office job that required transportation. We bought her a small Honda Civic that fit into our budget. Her salary covered the cost of a car, lunches, and new clothes needed for work. Although it was a simple job, I was happy with it. My name is William Smith, the most common name. I work as a disassembler for a company that manufactures industrial compressors. The work can be monotonous, but I find satisfaction in it. I am happy with my position and the salary it provides. Despite the fact that I was offered a promotion, I turned it down without informing my wife Donna. Another secret I kept from her was my decision to save money for retirement. Whenever possible, I bought an ounce of gold. There are more than 30 of them in my basement safe, and I was just starting out. My last expense was a Dodge Challenger. It was a gift from my late older brother John, who tragically died while working on an offshore oil platform. I really treasured the car that he left me in his will, despite the huge insurance costs. Donna has achieved success in her career at Gilbert Industrial. She was constantly promoted and promoted, and in her first year she often talked about her job. Over time her conversations about work and colleagues became rare. I felt a shift, but I couldn't determine its cause. In the hope of clarifying the situation, I expected a company retreat to be held this evening. The weekend event seemed like an obligation to me, and I felt out of place. I had run into her colleagues before, but I didn't like any of them. When I got on the freeway at Holbrook, I was looking forward to speeding up. Donna reacted the way I expected. She was unhappy with the speed, but chose to remain silent. Yes, I did exceed the speed limit. No, it didn't bother me. Bill, why are you in such a hurry? We have enough time to get to our destination. Could you slow down a bit? 
she said with concern in her voice. I'm not in a hurry. You know I didn't want to go there at all. I'm just taking this opportunity to give the engine a good run. It is important that it works without interruptions, I replied irritably. Please don't spoil my mood. This weekend is extremely important for my career, Donna asked. Mrs. Simpson emphasized the importance of your presence at the corporate event. As the wife of company president Glenn Robertson Simpson, she was well aware of the old capitals and traditions that surrounded the business. She explained that it is extremely important for you to fully understand my new role in the company in order to provide me with the necessary support and support. If you have any questions, Mrs. Simpson will be able to clarify them at the event. Donna explained the meaning of my presence at the event. I have constantly supported you in the past. What has changed now? I asked. With my new role, I have a lot of responsibilities. Marge advised me to introduce you to them gradually so that you can fully understand them. It may not be easy for you at first, but she guaranteed that in time you will understand everything, Donna replied. When we arrived at the cottage, my excitement grew. Donna's message was very clear. This weekend is going to be intriguing. Upon arrival, Donna headed to the cottage, leaving me to carry the bags. I felt a sense of humility wash over me when Toby Wallace, the company's assistant officer, praised my car. Hey, nice wheels, Mr. Smith. What year is she? 70 or 71? He asked. I replied, this is the 70s. Then Toby introduced me to his wife, Bonnie, who was sitting with him on the porch. Looking around, I noticed that most of the guests had already gone inside, leaving only a few cars and an old battered car at the end of the queue in the parking lot. We spent the next five minutes discussing my car. Why are you outside? Why aren't you and Bonnie inside with everyone else? I asked. It's not really our company, Toby replied. We were going to leave early, but Mrs. Simpson insisted that we stay. We came early to help set everything up. And the caterers have already left, so we're here, he added. I looked at them in a puzzled way and asked, You have to explain to me. What's going on? Toby hesitated, not knowing what to do. I don't want to upset you, but it seems to me that something suspicious is going on, possibly related to your wife, he said. Will you stay all weekend? I asked. No, that's why I parked my car on the side of the road so I could easily drive away. Toby replied. The situation was getting more intriguing by the minute. I need to take my things to our room. Just let me know when you're leaving, okay? I asked. Of course. Mr. Smith, please be careful. Don't make stupid decisions, Toby warned. Fortunately, I only had two small bags. When Mrs. Simpson came in, she noticed me, smiled and waved. Donna stood impatiently at the top of the stairs, clearly annoyed that I had taken so long. It's about time, Bill, she grumbled. We only have a few hours to prepare for the evening. Get yourself cleaned up and put on something beautiful. Tonight is special, and I want everything to be perfect. After receiving instructions, Donna informed me that she would go for a leisurely walk around the grounds to relax before our evening plans. When she left the room, grinning, I couldn't help but notice a slight coolness in the air, which made my own walk even more enjoyable. In total, 16 cars lined up in a row, mostly Mercedes, as well as several Jaguars and Lexuses. Surprisingly, four of them had numbers from other states on them. Watching luxury cars, I felt out of place, wondering how my wife could be among such a high-class company. Something was wrong when I noticed Toby and Bonnie loading things into their truck. I waved at them and went over to them to start a conversation. It looks like Mrs. Simpson has finally given you the green light to leave, I remarked. I'm not very comfortable here, Mr. Smith. Toby and I are kind of sneaking out, Bonnie said. Bonnie offered to stay, but I convinced her otherwise, Toby added. Could you do me a favor and stay until the evening buffet is over? I'm a little worried and I'll be grateful for the company, I asked. I have no idea what's going on, but I have a bad feeling, Bonnie said quietly. Great minds think the same way, don't they, Bonnie? I said. She blushed at my feeble attempt at a joke. I think you should stay. There are crabs and oysters in the queue to serve, I said. I started to think that I really liked Toby. Reluctantly, I dressed, 
as my wife insisted. As we were heading to the buffet, the hostess suddenly took my hand and led me to a secluded corner. She expressed gratitude for our presence at the event in support of Donna, stressing the importance of our continued support for her career growth. She mentioned that the compensation package for the new position is quite substantial and assured me that I would be satisfied. Curious, I asked what role she was talking about, since Donna spoke about it somewhat vaguely. It seemed to me that she had gone off topic when I tried to get the details out of her. She usually doesn't bring me up to date and tells me to wait for now. I explained my questions. Don't worry, William. I think she just wants to surprise you, Mrs. Simpson replied. You haven't answered my question, I repeated again. She has no official position. I suppose you can call her a personal assistant, she replied evasively. I understand, I nodded. The buffet looks delicious, Mrs. Simpson said, changing the subject. Thanks for the clarification, Mrs. Simpson, I thanked her. Please call me Marge, she replied with a smile. While Donna was chatting with the VIPs, I tried a little of everything that was on the buffet. Just as I was finishing the tasting, Mrs. Simpson came up to me. William, Donna mentioned that you came here today in your sports car, she said. Could you do us a favor and get some alcohol quickly? I gladly agreed, and she informed me that there were several cases of wine waiting for me at the store in Holbrook, and all of them had already been paid for. She assured me that there shouldn't be any problems, but that I should call her if there were any problems and take my phone with me. I gladly agreed to this assignment. I'll let Donna know and then I'll go, I replied. As she was leaving, I caught Toby's eye and asked him to meet me outside in five minutes. Donna just smiled when I told her about Mrs. Simpson's request for help and reminded me not to forget my phone. It was intriguing how they both emphasized the same thing. Toby, I have a request for you, I said, throwing him the car keys. He grinned back. Are you serious? He asked. Please go to Holbrook and pick up some wine for Mrs. Simpson at the store. I said. I have a suspicion that the reason for the delay may be some kind of problem. Did you catch my thought? I said confidentially. Toby grinned and agreed. Here's my phone. Just put it in the car. If it rings, don't pick up the phone. And whatever you do, don't turn it off. Any questions? I asked. How long should we be gone? Toby asked. At least two hours. And before returning to the cottage, fill up with gasoline. Have fun, I said. It was a little chilly outside, but fortunately I had the sense to put on a cozy jacket. Now all that remained was to wait and watch. From various vantage points located on the back porch, most of the interior of the house was visible. I settled down in a cozy place where I could watch without attracting attention. Donna seemed to be the center of everyone's attention, although I still didn't understand why. Her radiant smile, infectious laughter, and ease of communication gave her the look of a celebrity. About twenty minutes later, Mrs. Simpson and Donna huddled together, intently examining Donna's cell phone. I immediately understood their intentions. They were checking my location. Thanks to Toby, I was already closer to Holbrook. Mrs. Simpson smiled and raised her hand to speak, but I couldn't hear her words. The room seemed to fill with quiet approval almost like barely audible applause. Glenn Robertson Simpson walked over to Donna and took her hand as they walked up the main staircase. They stopped, raising their joined hands in a victorious gesture, and then laughed. As they climbed the stairs, the hall was filled with applause. There was still an hour and a half left before my car returned, and I decided to enjoy the moment. My trusty pocket knife, a cherished gift from my daughters ten years ago, has always been by my side. The sharp edge and durable steel made it an ideal tool for this job. After looking around the neighborhood, I focused on the cars that were closest to the house. Taking my time, I carefully removed each valve stem and put it in my jacket pocket. There was no hurry. I was in control. I didn't want to leave anything superfluous and I certainly didn't want to leave a mess on the Simpsons Road. I had to deal with 16 machines and 64 valve rods, and I had about an hour left to do everything about everything. Four cars were locked, but all the others were open. 
so I started collecting registration sheets from each of them, starting with the car closest to the cabin. Some of the forms were tucked into visors, others were stored in glove boxes. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with them, but I figured they might be useful in the future. While I was working, I realized that Toby was still 30 minutes away from returning, and I had enough time to finish what I started. I decided to remove the pads from the spare tires. Thanks to the easy access to the cars, I was able to get to the trunks, where I found 10 more rods. There were no spare tires on the two cars at all. Although I understood that my actions were petty and immature, they still brought me a small sense of satisfaction. I preferred to avoid conflicts, so all my actions were designed to be inconspicuous and secretive. I didn't feel insecure about myself, so I had no desire to seem cool or heroic. I allowed all alpha males to take on this role. Twenty minutes later, my car returned. Toby and Bonnie seemed to have a good time during the trip. He confirmed my suspicions that there was a delay in the store, which seemed to have been planned in advance. While they were gone, no one called my phone, so I turned it off and took out my SIM card. They couldn't wait to leave, so I thanked Toby, wished him a safe journey, and advised him to start looking for a new job as soon as possible. I knew that the crates of wine in the trunk were most likely very expensive, but it was a simple matter to solve this problem. I put all three boxes on the porch of the cottage to avoid accusations of theft. The road home was calm, because there was nothing valuable left in the house, only personal documents, a laptop, and my gold. At first, I thought of burning down the house before leaving, but I didn't want to make a martyr out of Donna. Two hours later, I was on the road again. I didn't see the need to leave an ordinary note or an engagement ring. I figured she'd figure it out on her own. I spent two days driving unnecessarily and without purpose. On Monday morning, I called work and quit, asking that my last paycheck be sent home to my parents in Carlisle. They were disappointed that I left without warning, and although I apologized, I did not explain the reason. I was reading a local newspaper for merchandisers and came across an interesting job advertisement at a nearby supermarket. They needed a man to work the night shift, who would take the goods off the shelves from 10 in the evening to 6 in the morning. Intrigued, I decided to go to the store after breakfast. It was located in a quaint old part of Chattanooga, where charming craftsman houses and many mobile homes stood. Driving through the area for the next hour, I couldn't help but imagine myself living in one of these cozy cottages, although I was hoping for more upscale housing. While on the street I came across an ad for renting an apartment in a garage. Although I haven't studied the housing market yet, I didn't want to miss this opportunity. The rental price did not include a garage, offering an additional $50 a month. I was able to rent an apartment. It was a cozy room with one bedroom, a bathroom, and basic furniture. A bed, a chest of drawers, a table and chairs. Despite the bathroom situation, the price and location were perfect. So I decided to move and decide the rest later. At least now I had a place I could call home. There was a unique situation in the supermarket. There were many applicants, but not so many that you could safely leave them alone at night. I spoke frankly with the owner, and eventually the deal was done when I offered to work informally, without benefits, and for a dollar less than they wanted. Surprisingly, they didn't even ask for my social security number. Work was a 10-minute walk from my apartment, so I spent the rest of the day settling into my new home. Both sides were satisfied with the agreement reached. The owner kindly provided me with his internet access code, for which I am very grateful to him. I went to the nearest Goodwill store and bought kitchen utensils and a small microwave oven. In addition, I bought bed linen and cleaning products. In the evening, I decided to cancel my life insurance policy. I decided not to interfere with the operation of my bank and credit cards. After all, what harm could it do? Since both of our daughters are now married, my departure has become somewhat easier. Although we didn't have any grandchildren yet, I was sure they would be coming soon. I contacted my daughter Laura to share the news. I contacted her to assure her that I was fine 
and asked her to be by her mother's side if she needed help. Laura knew I wasn't there, but Donna didn't tell me the details. She promised to keep her sister Linda informed. I deleted all missed calls from my wife and turned off the phone again. The thought flashed through my mind that I needed to take a shower. Maybe tomorrow. Everything has not been finalized yet. I needed to find a safe place for my gold. It may not be valuable to others, but it was very important to me. I bought a safe in Huntsville, Alabama, thinking they wouldn't be able to track me in Chattanooga. But my assumptions turned out to be wrong. Despite this, I felt a sense of relief knowing that I had made an attempt to protect myself. It took almost two hours to get to Huntsville, but I didn't mind. I took additional precautions. I installed a new latch and a heavy-duty lock on the garage door in my apartment to ensure the safety of my belongings. Mastering the new job went smoothly. A colleague helped me for the first three nights. When they left, I was left alone with myself. I wasn't required to help in the grocery or meat departments, but the frozen food department turned out to be the most difficult. But after a couple of weeks, I got over it. To solve the dilemma with the shower, I signed up for a subscription to Planet Fitness, paying only $20 in advance and $10 monthly. The only downside was that I had to provide my credit card information. I had to drive to Huntsville to get a credit card from a new bank, and I realized how difficult it is to completely disconnect from the network. I realized that something needed to be changed. I wasn't sure how determined Donna would be to look for me, or if she would be at all. But I decided to put this problem aside for now and deal with it when the time comes. I soon mastered the daily routine. My shift started at 10 in the evening and ended at 6 in the morning. To get to Planet Fitness, I had to either run fast for 20 minutes or walk leisurely for 30 minutes. Initially, I signed up for the gym just to have access to showers. But over time, I discovered that I also use various exercise machines. I devoted almost two hours to working out in the gym every day. Not only did I notice improvements in my physical health and weight loss, but I also felt a sense of accomplishment. Although I never considered myself to be overweight, I struggled with flabbiness, and I was pleased to see it decrease. Returning to constant physical activity has brought me a new sense of well-being. I found a comfortable rhythm at work and really enjoyed my duties. Despite the repetitive nature of my work, there was a sense of novelty in it that I found intriguing. I was able to focus on my work without constant interference, which allowed me to do my job perfectly. The gym also became a great choice for me and helped me achieve my fitness goals. I quickly determined which exercises I liked the most and which ones were better to skip. Heavy weights didn't bring me joy, so I avoided them. Daily runs to the gym have made treadmills unattractive. My daily routine started with a workout that lasted 30 minutes. Then, I would spend 20 minutes on a rowing machine, 20 minutes on a ladder stepper, and end up with 20 minutes on a vertical exercise bike. I wasn't interested in the TV. As a result, I bought a used desktop computer with a large monitor. Watching YouTube videos has become my usual source of entertainment. I didn't know how to cook, but I noticed a change in my eating habits. Unknowingly, I found myself gravitating towards the keto diet. In combination with an irregular work schedule, I involuntarily began to include intermittent fasting in my daily routine. After three months, I started to feel healthier and lost a few pounds. Feeling confident in myself, I decided to turn to my daughters again. This time I dialed Linda's number. Hello, I greeted her. Hello, I finally heard from you. We were all worried. Are you okay? Linda asked happily. Yes, everything is fine. Don't worry about me. I'll handle it myself. I'm just calling to see how your mom is doing, I asked. Actually, she's doing very well. She got a promotion at work and loves her job, although she's very upset about you. She mentioned that you dumped her at a party and ran away from home like an offended child. Those were her exact words, Linda said. She claimed that you were jealous of her success, Linda said. I cannot confirm or deny this statement until she decides to reveal the truth, I replied. She mentioned that finances are a little strained without your participation, but her recent promotion has made the situation a little easier, Linda shared. 
I am sincerely happy for her. Did she give any details about her new position? I asked. Only that she began to earn more and she had the opportunity to travel often, Linda replied with a sigh. I remained silent. After a while, Linda spoke again. Are you planning on coming home for Christmas? I don't think so, I replied. I'll try to send something for you and Laura, I said. To be honest, we don't need or want anything, Dad. We would prefer you to be here with us, the daughter said sadly. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Please give my regards to Laura. Bye, I said, and hung up. Feeling a little depressed, I couldn't help feeling that my daughters didn't fully understand the situation and blamed me for all the problems. It bothered me, but I didn't feel the need to justify myself. It was obvious that my wife had no remorse, and I couldn't get rid of the feeling of bitterness creeping into my soul. According to my daughter, Donna was fine without me. I couldn't understand why she insisted on my presence at home. Feeling depressed, I finished a case of beer and spent the weekend thinking. My alcohol consumption was increasing, but over time the situation began to change. I was doing a good job and got an unexpected pay raise. I gained more freedom in my role and quickly rebuilt the replenishment system, making significant improvements. I provide a weekly report to help determine stock levels and order intervals, which the store finds useful despite the efficient computer system it already has. My housing situation was completely in line with my needs and was affordable. I was losing weight and gaining muscle mass, and under certain lighting conditions I even started to have abs. I stopped shaving and now wore my hair long enough to tie it in a small ponytail. My overall appearance has been transformed, becoming a little more intimidating. Classes at the gym became more comfortable, and I began to spend more time there. Surprisingly, I started making acquaintances with the gym-goers. They were acquaintances rather than friends. I was careful with enthusiastic women to avoid misunderstandings. But it was a lot of fun with the guys. We made fun of each other. One unexpected friendship arose with a woman named Harry, or at least that's what everyone called her. She was known for her aloof demeanor and rarely entered into conversations with others. But I seemed to be the only exception to this rule. Every morning, without ceasing, she diligently practiced for at least two hours. Her classes were far from the usual yoga exercises. They were intense and purposeful. As far as I could tell, she looked about 40 years old, had a stern look in a wardrobe consisting exclusively of sweatpants and hoodies. While other women at the gym flaunted their toned bodies in tight, revealing outfits, she stood out for her more modest clothes. Even though I was teased for being the only man she talked to, I couldn't help but feel intrigued towards this mysterious woman. I did not actively support her, but I did not reject her in any way. I must admit, I felt a little flattered. Time has passed, and I have not addressed either my daughters or my wife. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Instead, I focused on replenishing my gold coin collection with trips to Huntsville, but then the situation started to change. William, can I talk to you for a minute? The fact that Harry called me by my full name was unusual because everyone else called me Bill. It made me stop and think. She had never addressed me by my first name before, so it was a surprise to me. Can I help you with something? We both found a bench and made ourselves comfortable. I have a corporate event on Friday evening and I need an escort, she explained. I will take care of all expenses and provide transportation because I know that you do not drive a car. If necessary, I can also compensate you for the expenses. I hesitated, and she immediately took my hand. I'm sorry. Maybe I did something or said something that upset you? She asked. No, not at all. It's just that there are some things in my past that I need to sort out, I replied. If you want to talk to me about this, I will be happy to help you. What exactly is the problem? She asked. Well, for starters, I'm married, I admitted with a sigh. Oh, I didn't know you were married. It probably complicates everything, she said thoughtfully. Not necessarily. I just wanted to be blunt. I haven't spoken to my wife in nine months, so I'm not even sure we're still married, I replied. 
Have you initiated legal proceedings regarding divorce or separation? She asked. No, I did not initiate it. Besides, I don't have the right outfit for going out. I don't have a suit, a jacket, a shirt, or even ordinary shoes. Since I don't need these things, I don't have them. I confessed sheepishly. Well, it's not a problem. I can arrange their purchase. I will resolve this issue a week before the meeting so that everything is in order. Harry assured me. Despite the fact that I work at night, I think I can provide myself with a day off without much difficulty. I agreed with her request. I am so grateful to you for solving this problem, she exclaimed with a smile, expressing her satisfaction. Is there anything else I should pay attention to? Maybe I should shave before the event? I asked sincerely. William, I admire your beard and hair, but I must admit that you could use a little grooming. Would you mind if my stylist looked at you on Friday afternoon? Harriet offered with a smile. I reluctantly agreed, and so began my professional relationship with Harry. The following Tuesday, I found myself in an institution of a slightly higher class than the one I was used to. Harry had arranged my visit in advance, and I ended up leaving with two pairs of trousers and two jackets. The outfit was complemented by a pair of shirts and several ties. I took it one step further by adding two turtlenecks, which I always liked and thought went well with jackets. Harry has already taken care of the payment. On the way back, I stopped and bought a new pair of high-quality shoes and underwear. Losing weight meant I needed new underwear, and the loafer-style shoes I chose were both stylish and elegant. My meeting with the stylist on Friday was successful. The stylist was friendly and experienced, which made the meeting enjoyable. He left me with a neatly trimmed beard and turned my tail into a short, modified mullet. I do not know exactly what this hairstyle is called, but it was longer at the back. He assured me that it would be easier to maintain my hairstyle this way, and I really liked the new look. He didn't say anything about Harry, but he mentioned that I was lucky. At six o'clock sharp, Harry drove up to my apartment. She stayed in the car and only honked briefly. Her Lexus seemed out of place in my neighborhood. I chose a gray jacket and a turtleneck, feeling confident in my appearance. Harry, before we go inside, could you clarify what I should or shouldn't do tonight? I asked. The first hour will most likely be spent on small talk. You don't need to take any part in this. Many of those present will turn out to be pretentious snobs that you'd better stay away from. If possible, avoid them. My main request is to stay close to me and block out unwanted attention. Just try to do it discreetly, she asked. Make sure that you always have a drink at hand, whether it's ginger ale or mineral water. Stay friendly and pleasant in communication and never lose your temper. Remember that you are here as my boyfriend, so make them believe that we are a couple. Although I've never seen myself in this role, I'm willing to give it a try. Do you think you can handle it? Harry asked, turning her head to me. Absolutely, I replied. And don't worry, there will be food. In an hour, we will get a rubber chicken on a plate and listen to some speeches, she said with a laugh. After that, there will be more communication and exchange of compliments. By the way, you look amazing, she remarked, winking at me. And then I noticed that I hadn't paid her a single compliment about her dress or hairstyle. I felt a little out of place. The beginning of the evening unfolded exactly as she described. My role turned out to be easier than expected. The hall was filled with single men in fancy suits and flashy watches. Harry looked amazing, and many of them knew that she was single. Many of them were not averse to starting a conversation with her. They assessed her interest, checked how interested she was. I couldn't resist giving them a suspicious look that reminded me of Charles Bronson. Surprisingly, it was effective. Every time I left to get her a drink, another one quickly came in my place. Some of them even brought her drinks, which she discreetly passed to me. Harry looked at me several times and smiled faintly. Finally, we were able to sit down at the table when suddenly 300 plates of chicken appeared out of nowhere. The dish on my plate was really disappointing. Although I usually don't find fault with food, this dish disappointed me. Looking at him, I couldn't help but think about the money I had just spent. Harry leaned over to me and asked, William, 
Do you want to leave here? She tried to speak with an accent like Bogart's, but it didn't work out. Without saying a word, I stood up, took her hand, and we walked out of the restaurant in silence. No one even seemed to notice our departure. As soon as we got to the parking lot, Harry took off her shoes and tossed me the keys to the Lexus. Find us a better meal, she said. And with that, we set off in search of a more satisfying meal. Twenty minutes later, we arrived at Willie's Hillbilly's restaurant. Each of us ate a full portion of ribs and washed them down with cold beer. She seems to be partial to Tabasco sauce. We both pushed aside the french fries that came with our dish. We eagerly put on the bibs that came with the dish. While we were eating, I couldn't help but notice something unusual. Her evening dress had long sleeves, unlike other women in the restaurant, who had mostly short sleeves or none at all. Despite this, she remained barefoot and did not seem at all embarrassed by it. The evening soon returned to normal, and I had a nice time with Harry. Despite the lack of intimacy, our relationship at the gym continued as usual. Three weeks later, Harry needed an escort to another event, and I agreed to accompany her. I felt it necessary to inform my boss about the situation, but he found it funny and said that I didn't need to ask for time off. It was enough to leave a note. He made it clear to me that I have to manage my own time. Harry's workouts at the gym were intense, with daily heavy loads. She had a high pulse and profuse sweating, and was always fully clothed. While most of the women in the gym wore sweatshirts and shorts, Harry preferred hoodies and long trousers. And this choice puzzled me, but I decided not to ask questions. Our second night was similar to the first, except for the lack of food and more alcohol. With the increase in the amount of alcohol she drank, unwanted suitors began to pay more attention to her, each of whom approached her with a fresh drink. I spent the evening collecting and throwing away unnecessary glasses. One of the most irritable guys has finally crossed the line in a relationship with me. I pulled him aside and calmly warned him that if he tried to molest my fiancé again, I would deal with him. He immediately disappeared for the rest of the evening, like many other scoundrels. I didn't think I could be so intimidating. After the event, we decided to eat sushi, but ended up spending $40 to buy sashimi. It was a pleasant, friendly evening. Two days later, Harry caught me off guard while I was exercising. Why did you say we were engaged? She asked, surprising me. Yesterday I was a little embarrassed when one of my work colleagues asked me about it. She didn't wait for an answer, but she smiled. I called Laura. She said Donna was avoiding her and Linda. All Laura knew was that Donna traveled a lot and that people regularly stayed at the house. I asked if her mother had filed for divorce, but she didn't know anything. He and Linda hadn't spoken in weeks. For some reason I got angry. The more bottles I emptied, the worse it got. The next day, I went to the post office and sent 74 valve rods to Glenn Simpson, Donna's boss at Gilbert Industries, in a flat box. I added a short note thanking him for a wonderful evening. Although it had been over a year since the party, I was sure he remembered it. I skipped gym classes that day because I didn't want to work out with a hangover. Later, Harry scolded me but I assured her that I would explain everything during our next dinner together. That evening, she picked me up at six o'clock. Harry treated me to a great dinner. It was the first time a woman had paid for me. I made sure to dress nicely for the occasion. Throughout the evening, she listened attentively to me, without making any judgments. I returned to my apartment just in time for the start of the work shift. The next day at the gym, Harry had another question for me. She asked if I knew anyone who had been at the cottage the night before. When I replied that I had the names and addresses of everyone present, her eyes sparkled with interest. After training, she came to my house, and I handed her an envelope with twelve documents for the car. She pulled me to her and kissed me on the cheek. There are fifteen different types of lawyers, and Harry turned out to be a crime lawyer. She tried to clarify the situation, but I just grinned and asked about the possible cost of services. Instead of answering, she gave me another peck on the cheek. Three days later, my daughter Linda called me. Donna contacted her to find out about my whereabouts. 
There were problems at Donna's job and she found herself in the middle of things, urgently needing my guidance. Linda held herself in check and refused to give her any information. I was curious how Glenn felt when he received these valve rods. After informing Harry that I would pick her up in 20 minutes, I headed to her office, located in an upscale shopping mall. The office was decorated with taste, without excessive extravagance. Harry had never seen my Challenger before, as we had never discussed whether I had a car. When I pulled up, the hum of the engine attracted the attention of several curious onlookers from her office. I greeted Harry with a smile as I opened the door for her, and she laughed at the sight of me. Impressive, William. Very impressive, she said approvingly. Are you implying that you want an engagement ring now? I asked with a laugh. Let's not rush things. Everything will be in its own time, she said, winking at me. I managed to hold off my opponent until we reached the Tennessee River. Then I decided to give her the opportunity to show her true potential. The track in the direction of Huntsville is a great road to drive, but not ideal for demonstration. We reached the land of dreams in just two hours. William, everyone who was in the cottage that night took care of themselves today, she began the conversation. What do you mean by taken care of? I asked in disbelief. This is a legal term meaning that we have filed charges. I studied your situation and came to the conclusion that you did not deserve such treatment from your wife and her colleagues, she replied. Does that really happen? I muttered. It seems that all the necessary categories have been met. Their behavior was deliberate, extreme, and caused your severe emotional distress. Since we filed a lawsuit for only $100,000, the insurance companies advised them to simply pay this amount and avoid public litigation. It was covered by their insurance, so it wasn't a big personal loss for them, she added. Are you saying that we can get some money out of this? I exclaimed in surprise. William, I've already received three checks. Perhaps another one is on the way, she said happily. Do you think Donna has already been fired? I asked. I think so said Harry. Will this affect my divorce process? I asked another question. Have you applied yet? She asked. No, I haven't served yet. I was going to ask you to help me with this, I replied. Harry smiled broadly. William, pack a small bag and get the car ready. We're going on a trip to visit your wife. We will leave early on Thursday morning, she said happily. I couldn't help but smile at the thought. We left at 6 in the morning. After checking into the hotel 10 hours later, I decided to call Linda and arrange with Donna and Laura to join us for lunch at the Red Lobster the next day. The conversation at lunch was a little awkward, as we carefully selected dishes from the menu and ended up spending more than we had planned. However, we didn't mind, because it was the first meeting in a long time. Our conversation was difficult and laconic, as we both avoided discussing the boiling problems and did not want to spoil the evening. We had been in a platonic relationship for over a year now, and I was determined to make her feel comfortable. The evening turned out to be much less difficult than we had feared. We were a little out of it, but we coped with it and achieved the desired result. Donna seemed relieved that I wasn't disgusting, and I was pleased that it wasn't as terrible as she had imagined. We were both happy and satisfied. The next morning, we had a leisurely breakfast with Donna and the girls. I was wearing one of my new jackets paired with a dark turtleneck, and I felt confident in my outfit. Harry, on the other hand, was dressed in a light business suit that radiated lightness, but at the same time, professionalism. While my wife and daughters looked at me in awe, I introduced them to Harriet Parker, my confidant and lawyer. It was a somewhat awkward moment, but it was the best I could handle. No sooner had we started small talk than the waiter came over to order us drinks. I refused, not feeling hungry at the moment. Do you mind if I have a coffee? Donna spoke first, breaking the awkward silence at the table. I quickly looked around and saw that everyone was nodding in agreement. Why don't you bring us five cups of coffee and leave the pot on the table? I suggested to the waiter who nodded in response. I'm glad to know that you're doing well, Bill. Do you want to tell us what you've been doing for the last year? 
Donna asked with a sly smile. I was just working and giving you the opportunity to find yourself or whatever you're doing, I replied, teasing her. Harry nudged me under the table, signaling me to shut up. I was counting on you, but I was abandoned, Donna said angrily. Maybe you were looking for help, but not from me, I replied angrily. Mom, Dad, please stop. I doubt very much that you arranged this meeting to quarrel, Laura said. Dad, what is the purpose of our gathering? Linda asked in a tone that brooked no objections. It was obvious that this meeting would not last long. I didn't know what to do next. I asked Harry for advice, but she ignored me and took the conversation into her own hands. Harry reached into her purse and took out an envelope. She passed it across the table to Donna. Mrs. Smith, this is a divorce petition. I think you'll find it very fair. I advise you to take it to your lawyer so he can examine it, Harry said. Laura and Linda looked at each other in amazement. It was obvious that they hadn't expected this. Donna smiled broadly. She didn't take the envelope from Harry, but reached under the table and took one of them out of her purse. You're a fool. I divorced you eight months ago for running away, she replied. Donna stood up abruptly with anger in her eyes and left. Harry and I laughed together and asked the waiter to bring the menu. Lunch with Harry, Laura, and Linda was pleasant, but I couldn't help feeling a little detached. It has always been difficult for me to understand women. The girls exchanged numbers and promised to keep in touch, after which we returned to the room to pack our things. Harry was surprised when I said that we would stay one more night, just not in this place. We packed up quickly, and an hour and a half later, we were in Elkton, Maryland. Half an hour later, Harriet Parker turned into Harry Smith. We decided not to continue the journey, but to stay overnight in Luray, Virginia. We found a house with a garage for three cars to live happily. The girls mentioned that Donna was furious when she found out that I had received $2 million from Gilbert Industries. As a result, Donna moved to Iowa, and I have a feeling that this has something to do with the missed opportunity to get these $2 million. To be honest, I may not be the sharpest and most observant person, but don't dwell on it. It took me a while to figure out what was going on behind my back, and now that I've realized it, I could use some help determining my next steps. Even though I still have feelings for her, I can't stand her anymore. As for the children, I'm at a loss. Just thinking about them makes me sick, and I rush to the bathroom to throw up all the Jack Daniels I drank, which cost me $30. Let's start from the beginning. My name is Simon Messina, and I have been happily married to Janice for nine years now. Our story began more than ten years ago, when I had an accident at work, as a result of which I suffered an arm injury that required stitches. Janice, the emergency room nurse, was serving me that day. Despite my attempts to flirt with her, she remained professional and focused on her work. She was a stunning woman with dark hair pulled back in a ponytail with long legs and a toned, attractive figure. While she injected a shot of Novocaine to numb the pain, and then stitched, I admired her brown eyes. It's strange that when you notice someone, you start seeing them everywhere, as if you bought a new car and suddenly saw it everywhere on the road. So it was with Janice. I often noticed her in the city, usually in the company of a man who seemed to make her happy. One evening I saw Janice and her boyfriend at a bar I frequented. It seemed that there was a quarrel between them and in the end he left her alone. Janice was sitting with her friends, clearly annoyed. I quickly turned away so as not to attract attention, but I couldn't help but overhear her tipsy tirade about a jealous boyfriend. Annoyed, she expressed her displeasure. Feeling it was time to leave before my eavesdropping became too obvious, I went out. Two weeks later, I saw Janice at the bar again, this time without her boyfriend. When the band was playing a song that I liked, I went over to her table. Hi. I'm not sure if you remember me from the ambulance a couple of months ago. I'm Simon. Do you want to dance? After a moment's thought, she agreed. That evening, our journey together began, and I felt incredibly happy. We dated for a month before moving on to an intimate relationship. Janice didn't rush things, and I respected her pace. 
Our first intimate moment was like something out of a romantic novel. We shared a wonderful dinner at an Italian restaurant, enjoying pasta, wine, and tiramisu. It was a perfect evening. I wasn't going to get Janice drunk, but I hoped it would help her relax a little. As a result, we ended up at my house. Up to this point, I had about 10 women, but nothing could compare to that unforgettable night with Janice. She was incredibly passionate. Her past experience in the bedroom didn't matter to me, as long as she was with me and only with me. Janice never gave me any reason to doubt her loyalty. Four months after our first meeting, I took Janice back to the pub where we first met and asked her to marry me. She gladly agreed, and we chose the first Saturday in June for the wedding. About two months after our engagement, I was hanging out at a pub with a friend when Janice's ex walked past our table, about to leave. He stopped and looked at me. You're Janice's fiancé, right? Yes, I hope there won't be any problems because she and I only started dating after you broke up. He assured me that there were no hard feelings between us. He said that he had his own reasons for breaking up and wished us well if we decided to get married, especially considering Janice's peculiarities regarding exclusivity. And with that, he left. I decided he was just offended and shook his head. There are a few additional details from my past that are important to mention. First of all, I was an outstanding wrestler at school and even got a scholarship to one of the state universities. But in junior high, things went awry when I got seriously injured fighting a rival from a rival school. He deliberately kneed me in the groin to avenge the defeat. I spent the next two days in the hospital for treatment, and when I came to, I couldn't continue competing until the end of the season. This incident led to a loss of motivation to study, which is why I dropped out of college and got a job with a local builder. Another wrestler from the team was suspended and lost his scholarship, but I decided not to press charges and focused on moving on. I faced loss early. I lost my father at the age of 12 and my mother 10 years later. Having no siblings or distant relatives, I felt empty until I found solace in Janice Penny's mother, who became like a parent to me. Janice's father left when she was a teenager, and the three of us stayed. Despite the fact that Janice contacted him every year, he never answered and did not attend our wedding, so her mother walked her down the aisle. I work as a Finnish carpenter specializing in restoration projects, and am considered one of the best on the West Coast, restoring old mansions for wealthy clients. I charge from $75 to $100 an hour and earn about $150,000 a year, not bad for a person who has not graduated from college. But it also means that I have to travel and spend one to two weeks away from home every month. Working with wealthy clients can be difficult because they sometimes treat you as an insignificant person. I once worked for a young actress in Los Angeles who bought a 10,000 square foot house and spent millions on its restoration. While I was working inside, she often lay naked by the pool, seemingly unaware of my presence. In another case, while working on a house in Beverly Hills, I witnessed how the hostess of the house had an affair with a boy from the pool in broad daylight. They engaged in intimate activities on a chaise longue, repeatedly changing their position. This situation bothered me because I took a liking to her husband. He treated me with respect and as an equal. He was a rich Hollywood producer who would come home from work, open two glasses of beer and chat with me about how my day had gone and how the work was progressing, offering me one of the drinks from his refrigerator filled with domestic long-necked. Despite the fact that I felt sorry for him because of his wife's infidelity, I decided not to get into an argument with him in case it was part of their agreement. I didn't want to upset him by finding out that his wife was cheating on him. Instead, after finishing the job and getting paid, I left without saying anything. I called his office anonymously and broke the news. He expressed gratitude, but later I found out that he was filing for divorce, which suggests that their marriage was not what it seemed. Now I'm faced with my own dilemma. Janice and I have two children, and that's where my stupidity comes in. But before you judge too harshly, remember that when Janice told me she was pregnant with her first child, three years into our marriage, 
I was overjoyed. I spent several weeks preparing a nursery with oak moldings and elegant sashes decorating the windows and doors. It was a beautiful room. When Jacob was born, I rushed to the hospital 30 minutes after Penny's call, having previously set up my schedule so that it included only local work in the area of the birth date so that I could attend the birth. Janice was ready to give birth, and I was mentally reviewing Lamaz's lessons, ready to accompany her in the process. Three hours later, the doctor announced, it started, and little Jacob was born. Since many new fathers often get nervous or faint at such moments, I couldn't help but be surprised when the nurse handed Jacob over to me, and I noticed that he seemed tanned. Janice and Penny exchanged glances with Jacob and then with me. Sensing the need to talk, Penny pulled me aside and revealed the reason for Jacob's appearance. Simon, we should have told you sooner, but it's time to find out the truth. My father was of mixed race. We were afraid that you wouldn't marry Janice if you found out that she had such roots, Penny explained. Confused, I replied, it doesn't make sense, Penny. Why should it matter to me? Then I told the story of the wrestler who ended my career by assuring Penny of his beliefs about the inadmissibility of discrimination. Relieved, Penny stressed the importance of my love and acceptance of our son Jacob. She also mentioned her brother, who lives in Denver, and showed me a picture of a man from her wallet. This is my brother Henry, she shared. He is a few years younger than me which created some problems when we went out with our family. People often stared at him or asked inappropriate questions. Eventually, my parents decided to move to San Francisco because it was a more tolerant and accepting place. When I heard Penny's story, it became clear to me, and I didn't want to be one of those judgmental people she was talking about. Therefore, I decided not to bring up this topic anymore. It wasn't until the first Christmas after Jacob was born that I finally met Penny's brother. Janice introduced him as Uncle Henry. I found that each of them has their own personal space, reflecting their personality. Henry's room was filled with sports memorabilia and family photos, and Penny's room was decorated with art and books. It was obvious that they were two separate individuals living under the same roof. Despite my initial discomfort, I realized that their close relationship was simply the result of their strong bond as siblings. I was comforted by the fact that each of them had their own space, but appearances can be deceiving. After the birth of our second child, a girl named after my mother Ginny, I felt that a family of four was the perfect option for us. Now we had two healthy children, a boy and a girl, and it seemed like a lot. After discussing this issue with Janice, we both agreed that we could focus on raising our two wonderful children. When I suggested a vasectomy, Janice chose an intrauterine device, which allowed us to change our minds in the future. And so, we made a decision. Two happy years of family life flew by unnoticed, and then I was attracted to work on the restoration project by an adorable middle-aged couple, Sharon and Tim, who turned out to be obstetricians and gynecologists. During a conversation that touched on medical topics, I accidentally mentioned to Sharon that Janice used an intrauterine device. Sharon, wisely, suggested an alternative because of the potential problems associated with prolonged use of the intrauterine device. She recommended that I have a vasectomy, but as a precaution, she advised me to freeze my material. I thought it over and decided to surprise Janice with the news of my vasectomy on Valentine's Day. It may not have been the most romantic gift, but it definitely surpassed household appliances. After consulting with a doctor, I was sent to a clinic where I could store my material and undergo the procedure. The doctor at the clinic explained that it would take several appointments to collect the material, so I made an appointment for the next three Fridays. It was a little awkward to go into the small room they had set aside for collecting material, supplemented with adult materials to create a mood. While browsing the Penthouse Letters magazine, I came across several provocative stories. Some of them caused me concern, such as those in which husbands were watching their wives with other men or wives were looking for men with great virtues. But one story that caught my attention was about a wife who surprised her husband by making threesome love with her best friend. 
I quickly handed in my sample before reading the story to the end. So I never found out if this was an isolated incident. After that, I handed the sample to the nurse and informed her that I would be back next week. The following Tuesday morning, the doctor called me and asked me to come either in the afternoon or the next day. I asked if we could discuss this issue over the phone, but he insisted on a face-to-face -face meeting. I agreed to come in the afternoon, but my mind was spinning with thoughts that something serious might have been found in my sperm, given the history of early death in my family. As I drove to the clinic, my thoughts were on how I could ensure the well-being of my family. The doctor greeted me with a firm handshake and wasted no time getting straight to the point. He asked if I had ever injured my scrotum. I told how I was kicked in the groin during a wrestling match, which led to severe swelling and required hospitalization. The doctor then informed me that this injury most likely caused fertility problems, as the sperm count was extremely low, which made natural conception unlikely. Shocked by this news, I began to realize the depth of the deception in my marriage and the life I led. I immediately canceled all remaining doctor visits, including a scheduled vasectomy. When I left the clinic, I felt numb, almost like a character from The Walking Dead. I knew I needed to find out the truth about my life without arousing Janice's suspicions. I spent the rest of the day at the bar across the street from the clinic, making a list of tasks on the bartender's notebook. After finishing my drink, I looked through the list, behave normally, check on the kids, contact Fred, talk to her father, protect your finances, get tested for sexually transmitted diseases, find a new place of residence, find out the truth, and take revenge. Fred, a friend who had recently gone through a divorce, was on my mind when I woke up with a piercing headache the next morning. Despite the fact that Janice disapproved of my late drinking, I waved her off and pretended that everything was fine. My first lie of the day was to tell Janice that Fred was depressed, and we ended up having a drink together. That day I spent time in the garage, before and after lunch, working with tools. During dinner, I praised Janice for cooking, asked Jacob about his day at kindergarten, and paid attention to my two-year-old daughter. The most difficult part of the day was going to bed, when I had to pretend that everything was fine, kiss Janice goodnight, and pretend to be asleep. I collected saliva swabs from the children and myself, and then sent them to the clinic for analysis. After that, I went to the bank to open my own checking account. I called and fabricated an urgent repair job in Los Angeles. Instead of leaving for a few days as planned, I decided to make the flight to meet Janice's father for the first time. I found myself telling more lives than ever before, and it didn't suit me, but I felt it was necessary at the moment. I called my friend Fred from the airport to discuss the possibility of my marriage falling apart, and we agreed to talk in more detail when I get back from Florida. Larry Adonis, who owned a charter fishing boat in Key Largo, was surprised by my sudden visit, but agreed to meet with me. After arriving in Miami, renting a car and spending the night at the hotel, I planned to go to Larry's marina the next day. When I arrived, Larry steered his boat to the dock at exactly noon. Two of his clients got off the boat with their catch, and Larry, a handsome man, slim build with gray hair and a deep Greek fisherman's tan, noticed me in the crowd. He probably recognized me from the Christmas card Janice sent him with a family photo. He came up to me and held out his hand for a firm handshake. Nice to meet you, Simon, he said, getting straight to the point. I quickly explained the reason why I was looking for him. Wait a minute, did Penny tell you that Henry is her brother? What is it? he asked, trying to hide a grin. He's not her brother. He's her constant and constant lover and the reason my marriage broke up. People think I'm a villain because I abandoned my family, but... Let me explain why I'm here in Key Largo, he continued, starting the story. Janice started playing basketball in elementary school, and by high school she was experienced enough to join the traveling AAU team. It was a financial burden, as I insisted that Penny accompany her as an escort. We hoped this would lead to Janice getting a college scholarship, so I worked overtime while they were spending the weekend. 
At first, I wasn't worried about Penny's absence, believing that Janice would inform me if her mother behaved inappropriately with one of the fathers. Everything seemed to be going well in the first year, but in the second year, everything went differently. The elite team of boys and girls began to travel together more often, sometimes even twice a month. Janice became interested in one of the boys on the elite team, Henry Bishop Jr., to distinguish him from his father, Henry Bishop Sr. Simon. Do you see where this is going? Henry Sr. traveled with a team of boys as an escort, and it turned out that both bishops were attracted to women from Adonis. It later turned out that Bishop Sr.'s mother was white, and the same can be said about Bishop Jr.'s mother. In the end, it turned out that the younger one came to Janice's room every night, and Penny spent the night with the older one. It seemed like a mutually beneficial arrangement, until one of the parents took pity on me and warned me about what was happening. I decided to hire a private investigator and gathered evidence while they were on the trip. When they returned, I had already moved into the spare room, and Penny received the divorce papers the same week. Despite Penny's attempts to downplay the situation and claim that it only happened twice, the truth has now been revealed. But it was a lie, and I continued the divorce. The most painful part of it all was the betrayal. So I left Oregon, moved here, and never looked back. I must have been looking at Larry with a puzzled expression, wondering how I got into this mess. He looked at me and continued his story without much sympathy. After seeing a Christmas card with your family photo and two children who don't look like you, I contacted my friends in the West. They did a little research and shared their findings with me. I hate to break the bad news, Simon, but most likely your two children are not yours. I don't understand, Larry. If she's related to this guy, why didn't she marry him instead of me? Because, my friend, both Henrys are prone to trouble and often end up in prison. For the first time, Henry Jr. was arrested for selling illegal drugs to an undercover officer. He was only 20, a college sophomore on a basketball scholarship, but he followed in his father's footsteps. Like Henry Sr., Jr. always wanted more, more money, more cars, women and all that. As a result, he served a seven-year sentence due to lack of cooperation and possession of illegal funds when he was caught. My sources found out that he was released from prison a year before your son was born. Before Jacob was born, he got into trouble again, served time for a serious crime, and was imprisoned for another 18 months. Most likely, he came out just in time to impregnate Janice with your daughter. I could have intervened as soon as I found out about the situation, but decided not to intervene because I didn't know you and didn't think it was my right. I mistakenly thought that everything was fine with you. It turned out that you weren't okay at all. Now I understand how stupid I've been for the last four years. How could I be so naive? You're not stupid, Simon. You were just in love, and my conniving ex-wife took advantage of it. I have heard that you are a skilled carpenter with a successful business, and that requires intelligence. Let me share what I've learned over the years fishing on my boat with supposedly smart people. Most of them succeed in only one or two fields. And it's true. They use this knowledge as a shield. My ex and daughter took advantage of your trust in them as family members and your trusting nature. Besides, you were deceived by an expert. Let me tell you in more detail. Penny claimed to have been with Henry only twice. I was doubtful so she agreed to take a lie detector test. She passed it. The expert asked the question several times, and the results did not change. Penny was telling the truth. But something seemed wrong to me. That's why I asked Janice to take the test. Penny was furious, hurling insults at me for putting my daughter through such an ordeal. Janice clearly lacked Penny's experience, and when she took the test, it turned out that the two couples had been dating for five months. Take it as a lesson if they ever offer to take a test to prove their honesty. I thanked Larry for the information. He offered to buy me drinks and dinner, but I refused. It was time to go home and plan your next steps. I boarded an overnight flight to Portland and spent Wednesday strategizing my plans. Two days ago, I updated my list to include hiring a lawyer. Fred joined me for dinner that evening and gave me valuable advice, 
suggesting that I use the same aggressive lawyer his wife used instead of hiring her own lawyer. After several hours of sharing drinks and frustration, he kindly invited me to stay at his place, which allowed me not to tiptoe around Janice for another night. On Thursday, I made an appointment with a lawyer, transferred some finances, found a job outside the city for the next week, and bought two dictaphones. I decided not to use video surveillance because I couldn't stand the thought of seeing my wife with someone else. In the evening, I returned from my fake work trip and told Janice a story about meeting a famous reality TV star who didn't suspect anything. Lying was becoming natural to me. Despite the unpleasant nature of the situation, Janice showed no concern when I mentioned the upcoming week in Seattle, where I would be working for a wealthy Microsoft executive. True to my word, I discreetly installed recording devices in both the kitchen and the bedroom after Janice went to bed. The next day I checked the devices, and then loaded the tools into my truck and headed north, immersed in work. The clients in Seattle, a delightful couple with impeccable taste and lots of money, were a pleasant distraction from a boring week. When I got home on Sunday evening, I was looking forward to listening to the recordings the next morning. The audition caused me mixed emotions, as I expected, disappointment, since Janice and her lover had been engaged in intimate affairs all week, but also satisfaction, since I came across a frank conversation between Janice's lover and another person. This conversation took place after Janice went to the shower, and the recorder recorded the words, Hey man, are you ready for this? I recently received valuable information about a great opportunity. Janice accidentally overheard an elderly couple talking about an upcoming trip to Israel while she was at the clinic. She was able to gather enough details for us to understand that this would be an easy job. Janice even managed to find out their address, which turned out to be in a good area of the city. If you are interested, let me know. I will check this place tomorrow and the couple will be away next month. It seems that whoever her lover was talking to agreed, as the conversation quickly turned to planning a robbery while the elderly couple was out of town. I was faced with a dilemma, whether to report Janice when I turn him into the police. While it would have been nice to see Janice punished, I wasn't thrilled with the idea of looking after other people's children while their parents were in jail. At the moment, I couldn't help but feel indifferent to Janice's children since my own wounds were still fresh. They could end up in jail with her, and my lying mother-in-law will spend her retirement years raising the offspring of her lies. Over the next month, I remained calm and approached Janice with caution. Hidden cameras continued to record while I was away from work and captured her lover unknowingly revealing details of the upcoming robbery to his partner. On the night of the robbery, I pretended that I was out of town and parked my rental car near my house. When he and his accomplice left the crime scene, I called the police from a disposable phone, pretending to be a concerned neighbor. Officer, my neighbors have left and I just saw two people loading things into their van. It's a dark brown van with that number, I said. They drove south on Hiawatha Drive. I watched them from afar and watched the police detain two criminals. But the situation changed when I told him that on the eve of the robbery, I put a tool under the driver's seat of Henry's van. I'm not proud of this decision, but strangely enough, it doesn't stop me from sleeping at night. Let's just say a close friend gave it to me, and I deleted the serial number so it couldn't be linked to it. Henry, as a repeat offender, is forbidden to have a tool. If he is caught with this instrument, it will be his third offense which could result in a lengthy prison sentence under the state's three strikes law. Knowing that he was committing a crime by robbing the house, I had no doubts about the forgery of the instrument. It was a necessary step to make sure he faced the consequences of his actions. Having completed the first phase of my plan, I returned home the next day. Janice was sitting in the living room, tears streaming down her face. Her mom was sitting next to her on the couch, offering comfort, and Uncle Henry looked miserable in my favorite chair. What's wrong, Janice? Why are you crying? I asked, worried. It's terrible, Simon, she sobbed. My friend is dying of cancer. 
While she was talking I couldn't help but notice that the tears were somehow flowing too easily. It dawned on me that Janice had learned to cheat from her mom. I realized that I would never learn the truth from her. But before thinking about it any further, I decided to throw my own bomb. Well Janice, I don't want to add to your bad news, but here are the divorce papers. It's over between us. Their shocked expressions were priceless, like something out of a sitcom. Without saying another word, I got out, got into my truck, and drove southeast. Janice was supposed to receive an official notification from my lawyer's office the next day. The memories of their stunned faces will stay with me for a long time. The copy I left with the letter was made solely for my own peace of mind. In the letter I wrote, Janice, you lying person, my lawyer will handle our divorce proceedings. I left you the house, but I took everything else from our accounts, except for $3,000. You will be responsible for the mortgage, bills, and all other financial matters. They don't concern me anymore. I know that these children are not biologically mine. I will miss them, but I can't bear to look at them, knowing the circumstances of their conception. Perhaps Henry will be able to provide for his two children using his resources in prison. It's in your best interest not to dispute the terms of the divorce. I would not want your children who have both parents in prison to be raised by your mother and Uncle Henry. I know that you confided in Henry Jr. about the elderly couple's travel plans. If Henry remains silent and you do not agree to my terms, I will not hesitate to inform the authorities and ask them to examine the records at the clinic to find out who disclosed the information about the couple's schedule. Rest assured, I will carry out my threat without hesitation and will find pleasure in it. Do not try to contact me in any way. After learning the truth about you and your mother, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I'd rather talk to a rabid dog than listen to your lying words again. I won't wish you luck as that would be disingenuous. Go to hell and tell your horrible mother that she's invited too. The second phase of my revenge has been completed. The third stage will require some patience, but if everything goes well, it will be very entertaining. Over the past month, I have managed to buy two colonies of carpenter ants on the internet. It's amazing what you can buy online nowadays. During a visit to Penny's house, I quietly sneaked into her basement and placed ant colonies in secluded corners. Over the next few years, these ants would gradually weaken the construction of the rafters and walls, eventually making the house beyond repair. Knowing Penny's inattention to her home, she is unlikely to ever notice the gradual destruction. She didn't know that for the last six years, I had been paying all her utility and household expenses. At first, I was happy to take on this responsibility as a sign of gratitude to the woman who once was like a second mother to me. But everything changed when I revealed her involvement in the fraudulent scheme. Since I handled all the financial issues and the house was fully paid for, it was not difficult for me to cancel Penny's homeowner's insurance in the same month. No one would suspect anything until the inevitable moment came when they would have to file a lawsuit because of the damage caused by the ants. As the Sicilians say, revenge is a dish that is best served cold. And in this case, it was my turn to serve a revenge dish that Penny couldn't get over. When I left in my truck that day, I had everything I needed to start my life anew. Clothes, money, tools, and personal belongings. With Larry's help, I sold my truck and bought a boat in the Florida Keys. It will take time to gain a foothold in the Caribbean, but I had the means to do it. I loaded my tools onto a new motorboat and went to the islands. For the next three years, I lived on board a boat and worked as a finisher on various islands. One of my previous clients, a multimillionaire from Microsoft, bought a small island in the Bahamas, where I spent four months working on his new home. I also completed the interior decoration on two mega yachts owned by Saudi princes. Life on the islands is unique. Representatives of the working class, the middle class, and several wealthy people live here. Over time, I earned a good reputation among the wealthy residents of different islands, due to the fact that my living expenses were minimal. After three years on the island, 
I found myself in a comfortable financial position, with more money coming in than going out. And I'll tell you, I lived happily ever after. Have you dated women? Definitely. It was almost inevitable in this place where many women were looking for adventures. Some of them came here for their first native experience, but there were plenty of them for me. I've been in touch with a few friends from Portland, especially Fred, who has reconciled with his ex-wife. I made it clear to everyone that I shouldn't tell Janice my location or give her my contact details. In the second year of my island vacation, I persuaded Fred and his wife Emily to join me on St. Martin and spend a week on my yacht. I was thrilled with the idea of meeting an old friend. But my excitement turned into shock when I came to pick them up at the pier and saw Janice standing with them. She looked amazing, with the body of a 20-year-old girl, despite the fact that she was over 30, in a bikini and Daisy Duke shorts. I stopped the boat about 40 feet from the dock and backed up for another hundred feet before turning off the engine. As expected, my mobile phone rang just at that moment. Fred was on the line. Fred, what's going on? Why did you bring her here? I asked. Fred explained that Janice had been pestering Emily about me and had practically forced her into our trip. Emily made it clear that if Fred didn't agree to take Janice with him, he wouldn't get any action for the next year. I assured Fred that he would not fly alone for the next year, as he had fulfilled his part of the deal, but he would not join us on the boat this week. I suggested that Fred go back home, or try to go to the casino hotel, since there are usually not so many people there at this time of the year. When I finished talking, I heard screams from the dock. Emily and Janice were clearly upset. I called Kelly, a schoolteacher I met at a party last year up on deck. Kelly, who spent her summer holidays with me traveling around the islands, was insanely beautiful. Despite the fact that we had a friendly relationship, I knew that one day she would marry a millionaire. She seemed to radiate a certain sophistication and grace, which immediately attracted me. Despite my initial attraction to her, I tried to stay professional and focus on my work. But over time, I found myself constantly thinking about her and looking for reasons to be with her. I even found excuses to strike up a conversation with her, hoping to learn more about this charming woman. As time went on, our conversations became more frequent, and I felt a mutual attraction growing between us. We shared stories about our lives, dreams, and hobbies. There seemed to be a deep connection between us that went beyond mere physical attraction. Before I knew it, my stay at St. Bartus had come to an end and I realized that I didn't want to leave without expressing my feelings to her. Therefore, on the last day of my stay on the island, I plucked up the courage and confessed my feelings to her. To my surprise and delight, she reciprocated my feelings, and we spent a magical evening together under the stars. It was a moment of pure bliss, and I realized that I had found something special in her. Boarding the plane back home, I couldn't help but smile at the thought of what the future holds for us. Perhaps it was the beginning of a new chapter in my life filled with love, adventure, and endless possibilities. And when I looked out the window at the crystal clear waters of the Caribbean Sea, I knew that I was ready to accept any challenges that lay ahead of me, as long as she was by my side. She greeted me with a smile that reached both lips and eyes. Hello, Mr. Messina, she said. My parents mentioned that you would be working here, but they assured me that everything would be fine if I didn't bother you. I wanted to tell her that all I wanted was for her to leave me alone. I'm sorry, miss, I said. You know my name, but I do not know yours. She admitted that her parents had not talked about my arrival. No, I'm afraid not, she said. I'm really sorry. I'm Simone. I can rent a room in the city while you work. I think it won't be too difficult. You can continue to live here. It was convenient for your parents to live in the house while I was working. I'm staying at the guest house so as not to disturb the noise, but I can get back on my boat to the harbor if you prefer. My parents noted your respectful attitude and would not have allowed me to come if they had any doubts. Please continue to use the guest house because I can rest easy knowing that there is a gentleman nearby. 
The following weeks seemed like a dream to me, because Simone embodied the classic stereotype of a French woman that I saw in the movies. Her small breasts complemented her slender figure, and her short black hair, reminiscent of Audrey Toth from the movie Amelie, moved with the grace of a dancer. I was captivated by her presence. I found her simply amazing. Despite her privileged upbringing, she remained down to earth. Most of the time, she would cook lunch for us so that we could enjoy it together on the terrace. When we first ate together, we laughed at the fact that we had similar names. Simone had an amazing sense of humor, and I always tried to smile at her. As the days passed, my infatuation turned into love. In the end, she was the one who resolved the tension between us. Simon, I see the way you're looking at me. I understand what that means. I'm also aware of the differences in our backgrounds that may be keeping you at a distance. But let me tell you what I see in you. I see a wonderful man who overcomes adversity with grace. You have not allowed bitterness to consume you. You still find joy in life. I may have beauty and wealth, but I have not achieved so much myself. I try to be kind and good, and I sincerely believe that this is so. So please don't doubt yourself. Look at me as a woman who has fallen in love with an incredible man. I couldn't believe my luck when this amazing woman showed interest in me. Without thinking, I pulled her to me and kissed her. We shared a passionate moment, after which she offered to move into my room. We made love, and I gave it my all, remembering everything Janice had taught me how to please a woman. She kept exclaiming, Oh my God! And we continued to do this for several hours until we both fell asleep from exhaustion. The next morning, I woke up to the fact that Simone was still next to me and smiling at me. She moved so much that our intimacy continued, and then she said something that made me feel like I was on the ninth cloud. Where did you learn to give pleasure to a woman? You make love like a Frenchman. I could be satisfied with that, satisfied with my new life. But there was one more thing I needed to do. Five years after marrying Simone, and ten years after breaking up with Janice, I realized that it was time to move on and fully embrace this new chapter in my life. I shared with Janice a photo from our Paris home. The picture showed me, my wife Simone and our two children walking along the beach in St. Bardas. Simone looked dazzling in her bikini, and Jules and Juliet were beaming. Under the picture I wrote, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from me, my wife, and our two wonderful children, 